Hello and welcome to Vivid Mini Mods. Today we'll be looking at something a bit different and a brand new to this channel, 3D printing. You've probably seen other miniature YouTubers talk about 3D printers and how they might revolutionise tabletop gaming. With assets either freely available online or through dedicated patrons. Well, here at Vivid Mini Mods, we like to take things a step further. How about creating a miniature from scratch? Come up with the idea? Creating in Blender and then 3D printing that creation. That's exactly what I did. But, being a conversion channel, I didn't want to fully create a miniature. This would be the top half of a Dark Mechanicum Belisarius core model. Without further ado, here is my final design. This is the top half of the mini, so I'll be using the bottom of core. I glued them together, and there we go. Hope you enjoyed, and until next time... Wait, wait, wait. This isn't much of a video, just showing you my final mini and gluing it to the core model. Let's jump into Blender and look at how I made him. Firstly, I took inspiration from Drukhari, specifically the weapon on the Talos model. It looks like a twisted version of Roman Sign Axe to me, so I took a flat image of the piece and imported it into Paint.net, a free Photoshop editor. I enlarged the image so it was the only thing in the picture and saved it to my desktop. For this tutorial I'll be working in the final file, so you'll be able to see my final design compared to the ones I'm making again. Back in Blender I add the reference image, scale it a bit bigger, as about the same size as my finished axe. Ordinarily, if this was a blank file, I would make the whole model, export it, check the size, then go back and rescale to fit. But since I already got the file open, which is to scale, there's no need to do any of these extra steps. Now, to begin work on the body of the axe. When working in Blender, I prefer to stop the larger part of the model, then work on the details after the main piece is finished. I add a cube and resize it roughly to fit the reference image. There's no need to be too neat at this stage, as we'll be doing a lot of editing and before long it will even look like a cube. Once I've got this cube in a decent position, I enter edit mode and select the top face. Then, while holding down control, I right click where I want the next section to go. Continue doing this until I get the rough shape of the image. With the shape of the ass complete, I remove the reference image. Now it is time to work from imagination. I try not to use too many references when designing things in Blender, as sometimes it is obvious when something is straight up rip off. Instead, I only use them sparingly, like now. I have got the shape which I like, but want to add my own touches, so it look a bit more Dark Mechanicum and less Dark Eldar. Next, I divide the shape in two vertically with Ctrl R and scale it along the X axis to make a blade. Add a few more touches, like a hook at the top, again using the same method as before. Control, right click to extrude, and then loop cut around the center. You will find they only use a few select functions repeatedly when making the weapon. This is because, one, they are very powerful and useful functions that are used in a wide variety of applications, and two, because you are making a simple rigid body design. There are loads of tools in Blender to make almost lifelike models with soft curves and uniform patterns. Things that can create intricate details, which is far too small for the naked eye to see when printed out on 28mm scale. Now let's make a start on the chain blade. I add a cube and scale along the z-axis about the size of the top half of the weapon. I loop cut across the centre, use my mouse wheel to increase the number of cuts. Then select the top and bottom edges, I press Ctrl and B to create a bevel, smoothing them off. I then hold Alt when selecting the central loop cut to select it all around the shape, and press O to enable proportional editing, which will allow me to bend the shape into place. I use my mouse wheel to enlarge the selection and then push it until it bends the right shape. I then drag into place and resize it to fit right. A few more tweaks to the body so the shape looks correct, but something looks a bit off. The bottom of the chain saw just ends abruptly. We need to make a little adjustment to the body so it hugs it slightly.
Now I select all around the edge of the chain blade as I want the bevelum. I then select the inner part and use a new function called extrude along normals. This is different to normal extrude or control right click as we allow the extrusion to slide along its face rather than just in one axis. You can't really see it work here but later on I'll make the famous add mech cogs by doing the same function. Now let's make some teeth. Add a cube and select the top face, scale it down by clicking the number key 1 rather than slide my mouse. Using the same method as the chain blade, I curve the teeth slightly. Once it's the right size, I rotate it slightly. I'm pressing Ctrl and D, duplicate the shape, moving them down and around the blade. You notice I snap the side view quite a lot. I do this by pressing number key 3, which allows me to scale, rotate and move objects along only two axes, thus keeping them aligned to the centre of the weapon. Again, for simple design like this, it is key in keeping them uniform and mechanical. If I was making a Chaos or a Nurgle chain blade, I might misalign them to give them a rough and ragged feel. Also, when making objects that move through more than two axes, it is important not to snap using number keys. Like for mech and dendrites or wires that curve around objects, they need to feel more fluid and not rigid like this weapon. Let's compare it to the one I made earlier. You can see it does not look exactly the same, but when working with rough estimates it is difficult to replicate it exactly. Now I bevel the edges using Ctrl and B to smooth them out. Like the loop cut, you can use the mouse wheel to increase the number of variables, making them more or less smooth. Since this object is barely bigger than my thumbnail, I don't really need to make too much detail. With the weapon smooth, I then start on making the reverse cog. To do this I add a cylinder, scale up slightly, and then select every other face around it using the extrude along face function. Here you can see it worked to its full effect, so it extrudes in all directions from the centre rather than along one axis. I select the whole cylinder, and then the axe, and then control and minus to subtract one object from the other. This makes a really cool reverse cog, something I've never seen on Omnisign Axe or any of GW products for that matter. Quickly going through, adding a few more details before we move on to the back cog. I again use extrude long normals to make a cog before using a new function called insert face. I select both sides of the cylinder and click just I to make a circle within the face. These circles can then be manipulated like any other faces adding extra detail to the axe. For the next part I descend to my 3D cursor on the inner face. I haven't really mentioned the 3D cursor before as it did not play a big part, but it is the center point for many functions. Whenever I add a new object it is centered on the 3D cursor which is set to world origin at the moment. But I'm going to be using a spin function which will allow me to duplicate objects around a central point. I create some simple light bulbs using techniques you've already seen. Then I select all and head over to the left sidebar and click on spin which will cause a blue icon to appear around the 3D cursor. By clicking this it opens the option box. You might have seen this pop up a few times before but I haven't really used it. That's because either it was needed to, or a keyboard shortcuts dealt with them quicker. Now though I do need to use it. I select the angle to 360 degrees, so it forms a circle of duplicates. I then rotate it around a specific axis until the ring forms along the axis that I want. Now you can see there are multiple lights encompassing the cog. I adjust the number of lights that I want to space them out a bit, and then click off the box to confirm. I can now delete the lights that I don't need by selecting each one and then using Ctrl and Plus to select the individual parts. Now 
Next, add some flair to the chain blade by making stupidly oversized screws. To make the cutout where the stupidly oversized screwdriver would go, I selected points of opposite on the edge of the cylinder and joined them together with just the J. This is almost like a cut, allowing for the faces to be altered individually. Then I extruded them inwards. After resizing them, I used Ctrl and D to duplicate them and finally rotate them to add a bit of variety. Now onto my favourite function of Blender, one I did not learn until very late on. This function is one that is key to making a mini look like a dark mechanical model and elevates the status of, wow, that is really fucking cool. I'm of course talking about wires and tendrils, because what self-respect in dark mechanical tech priest would be seen dead without a hundred tendrils and a thousand wires. Small wires, long wires, thin wires, thick wires, floppy wires, rigid wires, and wires that can pop out your eyeball and go rummaging around deep inside your brain. Okay, so let's add a cylinder and a new object in the curves category, the nerves path. You can think of it like the nerves is the spine and the cylinder is the meat around it. We'll use the nerves to twist and bend the wire to our liking and alter the shape and the size of using the cylinder. To do this, we need to go to the right toolbar and add a curve modifier for the cylinder. I select the nerve path from the drop down to link the two of them together. Next is one of the most important steps to make loop cuts using Ctrl and R all down the body of the cylinder. These will act as joints where the wire will bend. Without them, you'll just have a rigid pipe being twisted in all manner of heretical shapes. Okay, let's test it out. We have a floppy bottom. We have wiggly hips. And we have a head banging top. Okay. Now we do a little bit of repositioning so the new path runs all along the cylinder. Let's bring back the axe and get the wire in position. When moving the wire, it's important that you only select the nerves path and only move it when in edit mode, as otherwise the link between the objects will warp and it's a nightmare trying to get them back together. With the wire in a rough position, it's time to change the shape so it looks like a wire and not just a piece of string. You can see when I select the cylinder in edit mode, there is nowhere to be seen. That is because not linked in edit mode. By clicking the buttons on the side, you can change how you move the object. I scale down to be thinner and move it to its final position, but it still looks a little rigid, so I divide the nerves up, allowing it to make a more complex curve. It's not a thick shape, but it still looks like a floppy sausage, and we all know I'd met with a toss and technology, so let's wire up this bad boy. In edit mode, I select every other loop cut going around the wire and bevel it using Ctrl B. But what is the point in beveling if you've already got a curved surface? Well, it's a simple way to make loop cuts that are all located at a certain place. This will increase the detail and allow me to change the shape in a localised area. I select the loops using Alt when clicking on them and then scale them down in all but the Z axis by clicking Shift Z when scaling. And there we have it. A simple chunky wire. But of course there are countless possibilities when editing. For my model I create two very distinct tendrils. I call them grabby and pointy. They are very dark mechanical in their design. I again took inspiration from the Drakari as well as artwork from around the web. They both use similar principles. There's a nerves path and there's a cylinder. But in this case the cylinder has been heavily customized by joining together multiple objects into one, the curve treats them all as one solid object. So let's take a look at the final model in Blender. This took a fair bit of time. If you had to guess, I would say about a hundred or more hours for all these parts. Unfortunately, this model is too detailed. I know it sounds weird saying that when I personally strive to pack in as much detail in my minis as possible. But when it is printed, the details are so small it is impossible to see them. 
After all, this small little computer screen is larger than my hand, but when it's printed, it'll be smaller than my thumb, and an incredible amount of detail is lost. Once I've painted it, even more fine intricacies will be obscured by primer, paint, wash and highlights. And so going forward, I will learn not to make something as detailed as this again. GW has detailed down to a fine art. They know when to add more and when to leave it open. But on this model, you might see small nubbins and delicate creases. They leave them as large bolts and deep curves. But everything is a learning curve and I am more than happy with how it's turned out when it printed. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I split the model into parts, make it easier to print and export them as an STL file. Once I have all the STLs, it was time to convert them into something printable. I opened up in a program called Chitterbox, which does all the hard work converting them for my printer, the Photon S. I rotate them and scale them as needed, so they'll be easier to print. When printing, you have what I think of as the top side and the underside. The top side touches the plate, it is covered in supports, and is the place where you will lose most of the details which aren't supported correctly. The underside is where you get most of the detail and doesn't require many supports. So for the axe, I turn it so the front with the chain blades are on the underside. Then onto supports, the bane of my 3D printing life. Deciding how many or few supports you need will make or break a model. In some cases, it will leave you with a lump of resin in the vat which you need a deep clean to remove. Chitterbox is pretty good at allocating supports. I select heavy supports and let it calculate away. It is, however, a bit overcautious. That heavy support in the nose will have to go and be replaced with a medium one instead, otherwise I will lose all the detail. Underneath the model, it paints the red parts and areas which are most in need of supports, which makes manual supporting much easier to place. To be on the safe side, I cover the large underneath parts of the mini with heavy supports, which will hold it firmly to the plate as it rises and falls into the vat of person. For the axe, I was happy enough with the automated supports. Now to slice it. This tells the printer how many layers are needed and where one layer ends and the next begins. It is similar to those 3D puzzles you used to get with the weird shapes and flat once you put them all together they make the 3D object. It will then show you each layer as would be printed as well as other details including the time it will take and the rough cost the amount of resin needed. These are two of the largest pieces of the model I will take around 3 hours and 20 minutes to print and will run me up a grand total of 38 pence. I saved the file, but it is not ready to print yet. I need to format it by opening it in a photon slicer and saving it as a file which the printer will recognise. And that is it. I would show you the printer making all the up and down motions like all the other YouTubers that have 3D printers, but I have neither the time nor the equipment to film for three and a half hours. So let me instead treat you to an MS Paint recreation of it. Okay, so since I spent most of my time showing you how I made my conversion parts, and you've already seen them glued together from the start of the video, I guess it's really time to head to the turntables and let's see the fully painted mini. Quickly before you click away, I'll be putting up another video showing my full painting process in like a chill out paint video with no voiceover, just some ambient music and thundery rain for all you ASMR freaks like myself who just like having something on the background when they paint them. Okay, so this was a very different video from my normal ones and probably from any other conversion video on YouTube. So let me know in the comments if you would like to see something similar, or maybe some more tutorials on Blender, or if you fell asleep and only happen to wake up now. Drop a like if you like, and pop a sub if you want to see more, and until next time, I'll catch you all soon.